You also portray the leadership that grows up in Laos, in part because the traditional leaders weren't there. Describe some of the non-traditional leaders. John was one, but there are others. There were. And, and by traditional leaders, of course, when we think about the civil rights movement, we think about preachers and teachers uh, and business persons. But in rural Lowndes County, Alabama, there were only a handful of teachers, who many of whom were afraid to get involved for fear of losing their jobs. And this was a rural county, so you didn't have these big urban churches. Uh, so it wasn't preachers who led the churches. It was the ordinary, er, ordinary everyday folk. Uh, and many of those ordinary everyday folk were church women. Uh, and so church women, African-American women uh, involved in the church who were domestic workers, who were sharecroppers, small landowners, really rise to the surface uh, and become central figures working in tandem, like a woman named Lillian McGill, working in tandem with John Hewlett. So it wasn't just a men's movement uh, in fighting for freedom rights and fighting uh, the civil rights movement, but it was also a women's movement in that they were central uh, to the struggle. Now, one of the things that you, you know, you're, you're doing in this book is really turning history upside down in the sense that the traditional, usually wrong, narrative is, um, well, you need, that the most radicalism comes from the urban centers yes. and the north and all the rest. You, on the cover of your book is a, is a graphic people will recognize. It's a picture of the Black Panther. Mm. Um, this wasn't an import from Oakland. No. In fact, it was an export from Alabama. Uh, the, what they do in creating this Lowndes County Freedom Party, this independent political party, is they choose a ballot symbol uh, because of the high rate of illiteracy in Alabama. And they choose as their ballot symbol something that's indigenous to the, to the area. And that was a Black Panther. And they do this at the end of 1965, beginning of 1966. And they chose the Black Panther uh, in part because they, the, the symbol for the Alabama Democratic Party was a white rooster. And these being rural folk understanding uh, nature, they said that cats chase roosters <laughs> and they devour roosters. And come election day, we're going to devour this rooster. But they also said that cats are peaceful animals, but when backed up, when they find themselves cornered, they will come out fighting for life or death. And that this is the situation that African Americans found themselves in. So you're absolutely right. This the the symbol of the Black Power era that we associate with the Black Panthers of Oakland and urbanization is born in the uh, Black Belt soil of the rural and South. And not just the symbol, but the strategy and tactic of self-defense and armed self-defense. I mean, ironically, this rural county was the source of the inspiration for the Black Power movement, I mean, the Black Panther organizers, according to your book, um, in particular because they asserted and had asserted since the 1880s their right to defend themselves with arms. Absolutely. I mean, one of the things that we often gloss over uh, when we talk about the African-American freedom struggle and the civil rights movement is armed self-defense. I mean, we get so caught up with the idea that this was a nonviolent movement. And to a certain extent, obviously, it was. But not everybody subscribed to nonviolence as a way of life. They embraced nonviolence also as a tactic. And as any military strategist will tell you, tactics are useful and deployed at certain moments in time. And these people, people were deeply under attack. They were. They were. And, and they were under people, attack. People being lynched, people being shot. And, and not just from unmasked, unknown people. I mean, these were their white neighbors. I mean, they knew who were committing the crimes over the course of a century or more. And so it wasn't anything for them to pick up their guns in defense of themselves, not to parade around with them with grandiose displays of bravado, uh, but in a sort of organic way to say we have a right to defend ourselves. So there's so much more in your book, and I really encourage people to take a look at it. You really talk about how movements relate to parties and people relate to movements, and it's the stuff I love. But to move to the present, in the sense that you r trace the roots of this movement from the 60s in back into the 18. 80s in particular, um, do you worry that the same roots exist for the opposition, for the pro-segregationist, pro-American apartheid um, right today? No, absolutely. I mean, and we're hearing it in the language that is being used today, this sort of anti-government language. I mean, it's the same language that even before uh, 1865, the Confederacy used, the government is against us. Uh, we see it uh, in 1965, George Wallace and so many political conservatives who are fighting to maintain the status quo, maintain segregation, are anti-government. We see Ronald Reagan saying it in, the, in, in the 1980s, government is the enemy. And now with Barack Obama uh, and the Democrats in control of uh, the Congress, 
We hear the same thing. The government is the is the enemy. Do so you it has are a you long are disturbed by scenes like this captured by Max Blumenthal for alternate at this last weekend's tea, pa tea baggers rally in Washington? I'm afraid he's going to do what Hitler could never do, and that's destroy the United States of America. Who do you think is more dangerous, Al Qaeda or Obama? Obama. Obama is more dangerous than Osama. Absolutely. Why? Why? He's trying to change the country from within. We can fight Al Qaeda. We can't kill Obama. He is the enemy within. That's why. Is that Barack Obama's birth certificate? No. <laughs> yes, it is. This is Barack Obama's. That's huge. Professor Jeffers. You know, it's this is very disturbing. Uh, but we've seen it before. Again, I mean, this is sort of the anti-government. Uh, the government is the enemy, and we must. The next logical step isn't just remove the president, but it's this effort to delegitimize the government. And any time, anybody who studies sort of uprising and conservative movements and even revolution knows that it's a, sh a quick step between saying that the government that exists is illegitimate to some type of serious action to remove and uh, overturn that particular Are you government. violence? You know, it's, it's, it, it, that's the next logical step, and you worry about it. You know, when people show up at these rallies, uh, with guns. I mean, it's the creation of a culture that permits um, the possibility of violence. Because if you're, if you don't respect the office, if you don't respect the person, then and you say it's illegitimate, then what you are in essence saying is that you have a right and responsibility to take action to remove the illegitimate people mm. who are controlling the government. We can see history repeat. Hassan, Kwame, Jeffries, thank you so much. But you need to know your history to know whether it's repeating. Bloody Lounge is the book, Civil Rights and Black Power in Alabama's Black Belt. Check it out. Thanks for coming into Great thank TV. Thank you so much.